I'm very excited to welcome a new guest to the show. We have Oklahoma State Representative Mickey Dollins. And before the audience starts growling, he's a Democrat, which is an endangered species in Oklahoma at the moment. He was a teacher in the public school system who got sadly laid off by a round of budget cuts sent down by the GOP-controlled state legislature in 2016. And in response, he decided to help fix the problem from the inside by running for a seat in the state house. And he won, flipping a seat from red to blue in one of the reddest states we have. So great work. Representative Dollins, welcome to The Skeptocrat. Hey, Heath. Thank you for having me on. Glad to have you here. So I recently learned a bit more about your personal story, and it has a few interesting twists that I did not see coming. For example, a uh, tiny spoiler, there might be a bobsled involved at some point. So before we get into the latest news from Oklahoma, obviously we're going to talk about that. Can you start us off with a little bit about your background that led up to your career in politics? Yeah, that's one of the number one questions I get is, how does someone from Oklahoma end up on the USA bobsledding team? <laughs> and, <laughs> that's a great question. And uh, it was kind of a fluke. Like you said, there was a lot of twists, but um, I'm a fifth generation Oklahoman. And for any Okies who are listening, I grew up in Bartlesville, but I also lived in Claremore and Sky Took, but ended up graduating high school from Bartlesville and earned a football scholarship to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. And once I graduated, my plan was to come back to Oklahoma. I had a job lined up with an oil and gas company. And at that time, my younger brother, uh, he passed away. He was only 18 years old. And at the time, I was 23 and I had just finished playing my last football game. But it, he had always wanted me to try out for the NFL. So as a way to honor him and redirect a lot of that emotional energy into something positive, I decided, what the heck? And I had a pretty solid pro day, but obviously it didn't get drafted. And then about a week later, the USA bobsled team reached out and they said, we saw your performance. Uh, you did really well. Would you like to give bobsledding a shot? And my initial reaction was, there's nowhere to bobsled in, in Oklahoma or Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they invited me to Lake Placid, New York, which is upstate New York, and performed well up there. And I ended up on a four person bobsled team. I was the number two pusher. I'd jump in right after the driver and then the third and fourth guys would jump in, but they would call me kickstand because the way that my legs were positioned, my feet would slide underneath the driver's seat and I would kind of get down into a little cannonball. But every time we'd crash, I was, I was about six inches higher than everyone else. So I got the nickname kickstand. And so <laughs> life was literally going downhill <laughs> fast and uh, realized sure. after a few crashes why they recruit football players, because the people who are really good at pushing bobsleds, which are sprinters, like track athletes, they don't like getting hit. And so us mm -hmm. football players, we would just keep going. And I don't know what that says about us, but uh, we'll call it <laughs> perseverance. And uh, ended up for the first time in my life having the opportunity to travel overseas and compete against uh, athletes from different countries and got to learn more about their culture and, and, and their their systems. And while we didn't get a lot of chance to like see things, we, we, we did get to know the other athletes and that was really eye opening. So in 2014, I came back to Oklahoma. I went to work on a drilling rig. I was a roughneck for about a year and a half or two years. And, you know, in that cyclical industry, it's either boom or bust. And I happened to get in at, during the time of a bust. And eventually our rig was laid over and uh, we were all laid off. And so I went to go work for a much more modern oil company and I stepped foot on that rig and all the things that we used to do by hand had been replaced by automation. And that was kind of the first time I thought, wow, like these are, this is three Oklahoma jobs that have been displaced to automation, which was a good thing because it was safer, but still like that's less money in everyday Oklahomans pockets. And so I, after we were laid off, I know that my colleagues, they went searching for anything that could get them remotely close to what they were used to earning in the oil fields. And I became an English teacher at one of the largest high schools in uh, Oklahoma City. And uh, I started teaching freshman English and I loved it so much. I, I bought a home down the street and I did that for about a year and a half. And then in 20. 16, the governor at the time, we are in a super majority GOP state. Uh, they have just cut taxes for decades and finally caught up. <laughs> and I was one of 800 teachers laid off due to lack of funding, 
we had schools in Oklahoma going down to four day school weeks. And so with the newfound time on my hands and opportunity to seek further employment, I started going door to door and asking my neighbors, what would you change at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level? And if they asked me why I was running for office, I told them I'm running for mental health issues for people like my brother, for economic diversification, better jobs for people like my friends on the drilling rig, and then for fully funding public education so no other public school teachers would have to do what I went through, which was getting laid off due to lack of funding. And so in 2016, I flipped a red district blue and just happened to run in that district because that's where I was living. From there, we're, we're here today. So over the past six years, we've had success and a lot of headache. But um, each year, the GOP's policies continue to get more and more extreme. Sure do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Oh, absolutely. That, that is a great origin story. I like that between between the bobsledding and flipping a seat in Oklahoma, you've had multiple cool runnings. So yeah. uh, it's a 90s movie. I, I do bad puns. It's kind of my thing. So let's get right into the headline of late that uh, everybody's talking about with you in that headline. And it's about your weapons-grade trolling of the anti-choice crowd, especially the Republicans in Oklahoma in the anti-choice crowd. So they just passed the most restrictive abortion law of any state, banning the termination of a pregnancy after the stage of fertilization. And I'm pretty sure that's all of them. That's all the pregnancies. So in response to that, you proposed a future bill that would set up mandatory vasectomies as a way to prevent abortion. So tell us about that proposal. And, you know, tell us about the level of satire, in case anyone's confused, and what you're hoping will be the result of bringing that up. Yeah, so... You know, over the past decade, the so-called party of limited government and personal freedoms has become the party of intrusion. And for the past six years, I have listened to my colleagues in the super minority House Democratic Caucus bring up data, facts, actual stories from their constituents on the House floor. And it has made a little difference in their initiative to continue to pass more and more extreme legislation. Each year, there's an average of four to five anti-abortion bills that seeks to regulate, punish, and control women's reproductive rights. There is not one statute in Oklahoma that regulates a male's reproductive system. So during debate uh, just a few weeks ago, I made a tongue-in-cheek proposal that if you really want to get to the source of unwanted pregnancies, of preventing abortions, and I invited my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to join me in a hypothetical bill that would require that males get uh, vasectomies, which are reversible, and you would have thought the entire world flipped out. If you mention one little uh, (laughs) government control or mandate on the male reproductive system, it uh, everyone lost their minds. It's almost like they're saying, don't tread on me, but we'll tread on me. And so when I flipped sure. that script, I realized, I, I said, you know, there's, we're onto something here because that was the first time they started paying attention. And so they're not going to listen to facts. They're not going to listen to data. We have to fight fire with fire. And then being able to bring this to a larger scale, uh, to the national news, uh, to, to great podcasts like yours, has really helped some people who maybe not ever thought about it in a new light or a different perspective, maybe open their horizons a little bit and say, you know what, you know, if we're going to do irresponsible legislation like this, then obviously we've got to allow uh, expecting mothers to claim their zygote on their uh, on their tax returns as dependents. (laughs) That's an excellent point. You know, we have to require that life insurance companies allow um, expecting mothers to take out life insurance policies on an embryo. And, and of course, they're not going to be for that because life insurance companies do not recognize zygotes and fetuses and embryos as, as life. So they're not going to do it. But that's the problem with extreme bills like this is they put very little thought in the repercussions that they're going to have down the road. Yeah. It's almost like you've exposed a really ridiculous double standard here. And uh Yeah. I'm I'm so glad you're fighting against it. So it's clearly an issue that's important to you and, of course, very important to the uterus having population. So aside from the obvious importance of reproductive freedom as a general concept, why does the right to terminate a pregnancy matter so much? What are the consequences of 
Oklahoma's newly passed abortion ban, as you see it specifically? Well, one, uh, for the record, I don't advocate or uh, believe that the government should be in anyone's reproductive rights. We should stay, you know, the GOP needs to stay out of the doctor's office, out of the bedroom, out of bathrooms. Amen. But it's important because in Oklahoma, the new GOP motto might as well be, if you're pre-born, you're all good. If you're pre-K, good luck. And that is a nod to the late, great George Carlin. But there's a lot of truth in that. We are in some of the lowest metrics in the entire country when it comes to maternal death rates, when it comes to funding education, when it comes to helping people who are relying on social safety nets. It truly is a matter of, hey, if you, we're going to do everything we can while you're in the womb, but are you truly pro-life when all five of the GOP Congress members who are in D.C. vote against the baby formula proposal and and sending emergency funding to the FDA to make sure that it's safe for consumption. It just doesn't match up. And I think that in the minority caucus, like, there's 101 representatives in, in Oklahoma and in, in the House, and there's only 18 Democrats and 17 currently that are there. The power that we have is that microphone and the ability to use our platforms to get a message out, to advocate for people who feel like they have no friends at the Capitol. They feel like all they hear is these this like bigotry and hateful policies and, and especially now attacking trans kids. But it's important for us in the minority caucus to remember that we're the conscience. We're the conscience of that of that body. And we have an obligation to our constituents and the underdogs and the people who are underrepresented to get on that microphone and use a, a, our, our platforms to send a message out there and let them know that they have allies who are fighting for them at the Capitol as well. That's fantastic. And yes, certainly the phrase pro-life is very selective. I'm glad you're representing the very important lives that are not part of that definition in some people's heads, which is terrifying. One other detail on this, are you worried about what kind of restrictions to reproductive freedom might come next as kind of the slippery slope of this sort of thing? Yeah, throughout my six years in the legislature, if there's one thing I've noticed, it's that if there's a GOP controlled state that has passed something, you can be you can count on it, that it will sweep like wildfire through all the other GOP states, primarily because of bill mills like ALEC that basically are mad libs for legislation. You know, you fill in your name, state, copy, paste, legislate, that type of deal. That's why it's so easy for them to push national agendas. I already know that there are states in the South that are GOP controlled that are looking at banning IUDs, uh, banning mm -hmm. the morning after pill or birth control. And this sounds unrealistic to a lot of people. I just did an interview with a very large Catholic publication, and we were having a conversation, the interviewer and I. And I asked their opinion, how do they feel about contraceptives, birth control? And they said, it's immoral and it should be illegal. Well, how do you feel about the morning after pill, plan B? They said that in our opinion, that's murder and it needs to be outlawed. So this is the absolutely the path it's going down because throughout the years, they finally have accomplished their policy goals. It's like the dog that is chasing the car. And when it finally catches it, it doesn't know what to do because all it's done for the past 50 years is bark and chase, bark and chase. And then it catches the car and it's like, oh, no, we're still six months out from the general election. We need to manufacture more outrage so we have some red meat to bark at and red meat to get our base to the polls. So, of course, they're going to come after more trans kids. They're going to come after CRT. They're going to come after um, culturally divisive bills that they'll use, including taking um, anti-abortion bills a step further, like banning Plan B and IUDs, in order to manufacture outrage to get them through to the next election, which is six months on November 8th. But then what? They have to start all over. And it, that the issue with extremism is there's no end game in sight. And that's why it has to be called out. And hopefully, if enough people get a message out there like this, then people will become uh, privy to what their strategy is, because their actual policies that help underdogs and everyday average Oklahomans aren't there. That's not who they help. And so the way that they turn out their, that base is by manufacturing outrage and continuing to come up with divisive social issues.
yeah, you start with a wedge issue and you got to keep getting the, the wedge bigger as you go down. And now they're improvising new stuff to add to the wedge. And it's even more terrifying. Yes. Yeah. Not a good looking slope. Well, and they continue to manufacture that outrage instead of actually doing things that would actually reduce abortions, like raising the minimum wage, which in Oklahoma is 725, increasing the earned income tax credit, providing free birth control and family planning, making child care more affordable. You know, we're reversing this regressive tax system that we have, actually having real sex education in our schools, paid family leave. I mean, these bills are uh, Democrats introduce every single year and they don't get committee hearings. They don't even get a shot to be questioned or have real meaningful debate because the committee chairs in such a powerfully GOP controlled state will they just refuse to hear those ideas. They don't actually want to fix a problem. They just want something to run on. Right. If pro-life was the real issue, they would almost have to be in favor of all those things you just mentioned, obviously. Mm -hmm. So a big part of your job, I would imagine, is finding ways to craft bipartisan legislation that embodies some amount of the liberal voices in the state, kind of like the stuff you were just talking about. And as the minority whip, you're directly leading that push. So what are some examples of the importance of having progressive voices in the room, even when those voices aren't the majority? Were you able to make certain bills better than they would have been had there been no input from Democrats? Or you have examples of those? Oh, absolutely. And while we are such a small minority in the whole uh, House of Representatives, we play an incredibly important role in slowing down the process when they just start ramming through bills without question, without debate, without hearing Democrat bills. We have the ability through procedures to raise questions, to debate, to slow that train down to where they need to respect the institutions. It got so bad last session. We just finished our legislative session. There were bills being introduced in committee where the author wasn't even explaining their bill. And we had to call them out and say, hey, well, this is a mockery of our, of our institutions. You need to respect our process and actually explain your bill and then open it up for questions because there are a lot. So the minority party plays a role in making sure that the media is able to get more information on bills because uh, a lot of times with these Alex sponsored bills, if you start to really press them on their bills and ask questions, there's, you'll find out a lot of times they can't even answer. They don't know. They don't have the answer. And, and so that's pretty telling. And I feel like if the more times that those legislators are in those positions, even if they don't write their own bills, they're going to take time to read them which could is like the very bare minimum that they could be doing in the first place. So <laughs> think, yeah. you look at the minority party is um, putting accountability on the majority party. Yeah. At the very least, we can get the evil on record. Just want to be clear. I'd like my Republican colleague to say out loud, we're going to have a genital examiner for kids at public schools to determine bathroom eligibility. I want you to say that. Cool. Got it. Wow. Okay, so we're talking about some very unpleasant topics. Let's zoom out for a minute. We actually got this question during an AMA that we did, our little podcasting group, and I'm curious how you would have answered. If you were an absolute monarch, what are you going to do right away? Maybe give us your top three new laws as a serious answer, and maybe give us one law about fixing a pet peeve of yours or something like that. Well, if I were monarch for a day, the top three bills I would pass into law would be guaranteed housing and health care for all. Fantastic. Right now, it is so difficult for people to acquire home ownership, not only in Oklahoma, but across the entire country, but especially in Oklahoma, because our property value is pretty cheap. So you can have hedge fund investors, corporate guys from the east and west coast come in and buy up all the starter homes and then start charging way more in rent than they would be charging for a mortgage. And it's just so hard for people who are fully qualified, FHA, conventional, VA, are talking veterans here, are getting beat out for home ownership every single day because these corporate investors come in and offer cash, usually 25% over asking price. We've got to do something to rein that in. And I'm having an interim study this session that's going to look at four different facets that we can do when everything from Airbnb to corporate investors to these hedge fund investors that are buying mobile home lots and then raising the rent incredibly high on and, make, and, and pricing people out of their own mobile home parks. So we're going to address that. So number one, everyone should have the opportunity to achieve home ownership. 
Number two, universal health care, health care for all. Great. Number two. Yeah, we need we need people to be able to have access to the medicine that they need, the treatments that they need, and and the dental work and the eye work. And right now it's just gone. We're making small progress when it comes to insulin and and med- medical costs, but that's something that needs to be addressed on the federal level. And then fully funding our public education and career tech system. Love it. Making sure that those roughnecks who were working on the rigs will have the ability to go back and get the training they need to maybe work on a wind turbine, to do something in a similar industry, but have the ability and the resources available to them to get retrained and take off. Uh, if it's not the career that they've been in, find a new career that suits them well. And also in our education to retain more teachers and to just stop the mass exodus that we have right now and then to ensure that all our kids are college ready and that if they choose to go that route they're ready to go all right i'm i'm voting for you for absolute monarch i guess they don't usually get votes but i'm voting for you that's good stuff i guess my pet peeve bill i would say that every piece of legislation has to have full transparency on where it came from did it originate from the representative or senator's own mind was it a constituent request bill or is it an alec bill american legislative exchange council which is an organization that will connect with recently elected GOP members, wine and dine them, and when the time comes, start sliding them model legislation across their desk. And unfortunately, there's just so many of those that get introduced and passed each year. And it would be nice for the public and legislators to know exactly where those bills are coming from. Yes, that's a great answer. And in fact, I would all, I'm going to add one more. Uh, let's get rid of Citizens United kind of in that same vein. I'd like to know where the money comes from, too. Yeah, that's a great point. All right. Well, before we wrap it up, just one more question. And this is this is very, very important. And uh, honestly, apologies ahead of time. I'm, I might start a blood feud within your voting base. Here's the question. Oxford comma required by law or banned by law? Go. Well, as a former English major, I'm going to come out and say it. Yes. Yes to the Oxford comma. Yes. Okay. Well, now I'm definitely voting for you as absolute monarch. Well done. Uh, the more the more punctuation, the better. Exclamation! Exclamation! Exclamation mark. <laughs> Fantastic. Really appreciate your time. And if people wanted to hear more from you, perhaps on a podcast or on a website or on a social media platform, where where should they go to find that stuff? The best way to connect with me is on social media, Mickey Dollins, M-I-C-K-E-Y-D-O-L-L-E-N-S. Find me on Twitter, Instagram, and my Facebook page. Just type in that. I'm the only one in the country, M-I-C-K-E-Y-D-O-L-L-E-N-S. I'd love to hear from you. Fantastic. Representative Dollins, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate you having me. Anytime.